was the typical motherboard we had until a decade back wherein we had our CPU sitting here. It would be connected to a north bridge. The north bridge would be connected to the main memory. Also, it is connected to the south bridge. The south bridge is managing all the I.O. So a uh, block diagram of the same thing. We have the core. The FSB connects to the north bridge chip which can go to the graphics card also it will be connected to the dram using the buses and it connects to the south bridge using the dmi interface and the south bridge in turn manages many other io operations so the serial ata ports are typically used for our hard disk and if you look at the BIOS flash memory, that's where your boot up of the system happens. And we and you're already aware of the many USB ports that we have. So this was the scenario until a decade back. What happened sometime from 2005 6 time is the North Bridge was brought onto the chip. So Intel Snehalem architecture, it had four cores and we have the L3 cache which is shared across all the cores. And if you look at the periphery, you have a lot of I.O. and the memory controller. Almost in parallel, AMD's fusion architecture was developed by AMD and it too has the memory controller and some I.O. operations sitting on the processor code now what is the advantage of getting the memory controller on chip which is called integrated memory controller we can pass more information from the processor to the memory controller which will help us to do some better scheduling of the memory accesses at the memory controller also it can help us to manage the memory better in addition, it can also help us to manage the power consumption of this memory better based on the inputs from we get from various cores. If it was off chip to drive any of these extra informations, we would need an extra pin from the processor to the north bridge. But now we have more flexibility. The common memory hierarchy that we have seen so far Let's assume that we have four cores, core 0 to core 3. Each of these cores has a private L1 cache, instruction cache and data cache. They can be split or unified. Following that, there can be a second level of cache which is shared among few of these cores. Following that, we can have a L3 cache which is shared among all the cores. Any cache level that is shared among all the cores is called last level cache, LLC. And each of these cache has a corresponding cache controller. So if you look at the basic hardware of the cache, it is just the tag array and data array with some IO circuitry. But the control unit that actually does all the operations on it is the cache controller. Following the caches, we have the main memory, which is predominantly based on DRAM. We have its memory controller. Following that, we have the secondary memory and the disk controller. We'll now focus on the main memory and the memory controller. Now, if any one of you is wondering why should we study main memory, let's try to answer that question. Over the years, the technology at the core has improved dramatically. We have the concept of pipelining. Following the pipelining, it got expanded to out of order execution. We have much deeper pipelines now, and there can be multiple pipelines working in par parallel, making a superscalar processor. 
also we can have many more execution units fetch units and decode units to improve the overall performance of the core we can have a very complex and sophisticated branch prediction which can almost eliminate all the control hazards over the years designers have developed a very optimized instruction decoding logic also at a little abstract level there can be more than one thread running on the core so it can be a coarse grained or fine grained or simultaneous multi threading technology also intel has come up with a hyper threading technology basically we don't want to keep the core idle at any given moment following that we have multiple cores on a single chip even our mobile phones have eight cores also we can do overclocking on any of these cores overclocking means we can go over the regular standard specified speed or frequency and run it at a much higher frequency of course there are some side effects of overclocking like increased power dissipation so we need to do it in a controlled environment but as such if you want a improved performance for your core at least for short amount of time we can go for overclocking in addition we have a load store queue and highly optimized structure again just after the memory access stage it will help us in reducing the number of stalls because of the loads and stores and we have seen that following the core there are multiple levels of caches each cache can have multiple ports and we see that over the years the size of caches has improved in addition there are many optimizations on caches to improve their performance we have seen six of them we have prefetching we have misstatus handling registers so on so forth so the entire core and the cache on the chip have improved over the time now if that is the case why would i still need to look at the main memory aren't we getting the best performance that we can using the best possible core and caches let's try to answer that let's say we have a processor with a core running at 3.4 gigahertz and it has three levels of cache let's say l1 is 32 kilobyte in size and its access latency is 4 cycles and the hit rate is 95% l2 let's say is 512 kilobyte with 11 cycles miss penalty from l1 point of view and its hit rate say is 90% L3 is 8 megabyte with 36 cycles of latency and let's say its hit rate is 65%. Following that, let's say our, we have our main memory and let's assume that all the requests to the main memory are hits and it would take 80 nanoseconds for each access. With these values, if we quickly look at the A80 for different configurations. let's consider for an ideal l1 where all the accesses in the l1 are hits the amt would be 1.2 nanoseconds if you consider l1 and ideal l2 amt increases to 1.3 if we have l1 l2 and ideal l3 amt further increases to 1.33 nanoseconds and now if we have the entire memory hierarchy which is a more practical view the am80 increases to 1.46 nanoseconds now with the practical memory hierarchy we can't override it we are losing almost 17% in our am80 which can reflect in the worst case a 17% drop in the performance when compared to a single level of cache which is ideal now to this let's add multiple cores on the chip 
the moment we say multiple cores the l2 and l3 levels of cache will be shared across these cores so the hit rate of these cores can drop drastically in that case what happens is many requests reach the main memory and experience the 80 nanoseconds time which will eventually be reflected in at the pipeline as stalls and overall drop in the performance further over the years both the memory speed and the process speed have increased but the rate at which the memory performance has increased is much much slower than the processor speed and sometime around 2005 we moved from single core to unique uh, multi core till that point the memory's latency was an issue but post that in the multi core era we have the issue of the memory latency and memory bandwidth i have already presented this figure at the beginning of the memory hierarchy we call this the memory wall some more motivation on why we should study the main memory over the years the nature or the characteristics of the applications we run has changed dramatically the issues with the present day applications are they are very huge for example we have the big data applications they are widely deployed in banking communication healthcare and insurance education manufacturing government trade etc everywhere we have this big data applications which have huge memory footprint which typically don't fit in our on chip caches what it means is the on chip caches will have lot more misses and we will end up coming to the main memory also many of the current day applications don't have much locality now you know that the entire memory hierarchy is built on principle of locality spatial and temporal but the current applications don't have much of it examples are graph applications which are predominantly used in social networks our transportation networks utility graphs document link graph and neural network if you uh, want a quick example of document link graphs the way our web pages are arranged in the web on the web is a graph now if we are trying to access one web page there is no certainty that the uh, very next page that we are going to access will be some other some x it can be y some other time it can be some other new web page the same with our social networks too so these applications don't have much special locality also the temporal locality might be very less how many how often do we revisit the same web page or how often the data in the same web page changes if it is dynamic it keeps changing very often so where is the notion of the temporal locality here it's very less so for these applications the on chip caches which are predominantly built to capture this temporal and spatial locality have very limited scope so we eventually end up coming to the main memory most of the time in fact for many of these applications the main memory also needs to be very tailor made otherwise we'll end up going to the disk most of the time now with this motivation let's dive into the main memory and its memory controller i have given couple of links you can go through they are basically giving uh, some examples of what the big data applications are what graph applications mean so on so forth it's just for the curious ones not a compulsory read now let's say our uh, the dotted box is our chip we have the last level cache typically l3 following that we have our memory controller all the misses in llc would come to the memory controller 
and the memory controller has various jobs to do the first one is address mapping following that it will place the request into a transaction queue which can be dedicated for reads and writes as rq and wq post that each transaction is split into multiple commands and placed in one of these command queues following the command queues we have the memory scheduler which is managed by the controller in addition the memory controller needs to do few other maintenance jobs then it needs to manage the page table don't get confused with the page table we saw in the virtual memory this is the physical page table and it also needs to ensure timings for proper functioning of the dram the memory controller is having two buses address command bus and the data bus the typical address and command bus frequencies are something like 800 megahertz 933 megahertz to 1600 megahertz now we have even 2000 megahertz now the interesting point is the data bus frequency is twice the address bus frequency it means for an address bus frequency of 1200 megahertz the data bus frequency actually is 2400 megahertz that is the reason we call our dram as ddr double data rate dram what it typically means is the data will be transmitted on the data bus on both the positive edge and the negative edge of the clock cycle that's the way we ensure that the data bus frequency is twice the address bus frequency following that we have our dram currently it's a black box if you look at how the dram is logically organized we have channels each memory controller has a channel and each channel has its own dedicated address and command bus and the data bus and if we have multiple channels connect to connected to our processor chip all these channels can be accessed in parallel there is complete parallelism the channels are split into ranks typically 1 to 4 ranks are common all these ranks share the address bus address bus and the data bus now if you want to access two ranks back to back then we need to space them out by trtrs timing we are going to look at it uh, in the next few classes trtrs stands for rank to rank switching delay ranks are made up of banks 18 to uh, 8 to 16 banks are typical number per rank all these banks now use this single address bus and data bus and you can access two banks back to back in consecutive cycles based on the bus availability banks are further split into rows or pages here you can say that this is the dram page so we have three different pages now virtual page physical page and dram page so at any given moment we can access only one page in the bank to open it we need to send in an activate command to close it we need to send a precharge command and to access the data we need to send a cache command column access strobe command the typical sizes of this dram pages are somewhere between 4 kb 4 kilobyte to 8 kilobyte the rows are further split into columns for every access to the bank using the cache command one column of data is touched it means that either one column of data is read or written to 
usually the column size is 64 bytes and the time we need to transfer this 64 bytes on to on the data bus is t burst we are going to look at it in next class uh, next few classes let's continue our understanding of the logical organization of the dram bank let's say this is one row we have few of these making our bank at the end of these rows to identify each of these rows we need a row decoder and at the end of these rows we have what's called as row buffer now let's say we are sitting at the memory controller and we received a request request 1 to row 0 and column 2 the memory controller will look at the bank and sees that the row buffer is empty there is no page that is open in the row buffer so we call it page empty when it sees this the memory controller issues an activate along with the row address on the address and command bus the row decoder will decode this row and select one particular row and all the data in this row or all the columns in this row are read into the row buffer following this the memory controller now sends a cast command along with the column address here column 2 now that particular column is selected and sent out over the data bus now let's say the memory controller received another request request 2 to the same row but maybe to the same column or different column when the memory controller receives this request and observes the bank it finds row 0 to be open in the row buffer already so this is termed as page hit because the row is already open we send a cast command along with the column address that particular column is read out and sent over the data bus now let's say we received another request but this time to some other row for example row 10 here because the row which we want and the row that is open in the bank are different we term this as page miss when the memory controller sees a page miss it needs to close the page first that is currently open in this bank so it will send a precharge command the precharge command basically writes the data from the row buffer to the actual row and decouples all the IO circuitry now at this point the memory controller will send another activate with row address as row 10 following that it will send a cache with column address as 24 and the, eventually the data will be read out so this is the working of a DRAM bank from the memory controller perspective now occasionally we need to do what's called as refresh of these dram when the time comes the memory controller sends a refresh command to this dram bank when the dram bank receives this uh, receives this command the refresh controller which is sitting along with the dram bank gets activated and it will uh, issue sequence of activates and precharges so basically what we are doing is we are reading row 0 to the row buffer and writing it back the same thing can happen with row 1 we are sending an activate for row 1 we are reading the data to the row buffer and we are writing it back to that corresponding location so this way some predefined number of rows will be refreshed by the refresh controller whenever it receives the refresh command so we have been using the term dram that expands to dynamic random access memory a lot let's try to understand that a dram cell is made up of a capacitor 
grounded at one end if the capacitor has some charge we interpret that as if the DRAM cell is storing one if there is no charge in the capacitor then we say that the cell is storing a zero now how do we access this DRAM cell we have our dear our dear NMOS transistor again the gate terminal is our control terminal one end of this NMOS let's say the source terminal is connected to the capacitor and the drain is the other end if we want to so uh, this drain terminal is connected to the sense amplifier from where we read out the data when we want to read the data something called as charge sharing happens between the sense amplifier and the capacitor so let's assume that the capacitor is storing one it means that it is holding some charge so to read this cell we apply high voltage to the NMOS gate so that the source and drain get connected and the charge flows from the capacitor to the sense amplifier at this point the sense amplifier drives it has one because it has seen some charge on in the capacitor if there was no charge then sense amplifier will not see any charge and it will read out a zero now as you have observed the charge in this cap capacitor is no longer present that is the reason DRAM cell read operation is destructive it means the moment we try to read the capacitor the charge in it gets disturbed so we need to restore the value that is the reason we send the precharge command when we send a precharge command the charge in the sense amplifier will be stored back into the capacitor now why do we call this cell as dynamic the primary reason is the capacitor even if we are trying to access it or not will lose the charge over over time so we need to do periodic charge refill which is called as refresh now what we are doing uh, as a refresh operation we are accessing the cell we are reading the charge in the capacitor to the sense amplifier and we are writing it back the activate and precharge commands okay I have presented this device level detail just for giving an idea of how the DRAM cell is working. We haven't actually looked at more, uh, you know, finer details. I'm not going to do that. Now let's try to zoom out a little. Let's say this is our DRAM cell, capacitor and uh, transistor. And we have an array of such DRAM cells. The gate terminal of all these cells, which are in one row, are connected to a single wire. And let's say we have multiple such rows, and the drain terminals of these access transistors are now commonly connected to a single sense amplifier. the group of cells which are in one single row now form our page and the common gate terminal or oh sorry the uh, the wire which is connected to all the gate terminals in the row is called the word line and the wire that connects to all the drain terminals in the column is the bit line now the sense amplifiers the group of these will form our row buffer now we have an array of these dram cells we have a row decoder to identify one particular row and at the end of these dram cells we have the row buffer the row decoder will select one row all the data will be read into the sense amplifiers together called as row buffer and now one of these 
some or some part of this data is read out using a column multiplexer this is where we use the column address sent by the memory controller it is important to note that the actual location of the row will not have any valid data because of the destructive read operation so let's zoom out a little further we have one array and let's try to stack them in the third dimension then we have what's called as dram width if we stack four such arrays we call it as an export device if we stack eight such arrays we call it as an exit device many other device widths are possible from x16 to x72 now what is the significance of this dram width this width will determine the number of bits that can be read out from this group of dram arrays or we can call it as dram device now if we have an x4 device it means that each cycle this device will give us four bits of data if we have an x72 device then we can re read out 72 bits of data in each cycle now with all the understanding of the dram cell and array and dram device now let's come to the physical dram organization that we find we can actually see with our eyes now yes the physical drams are divided into channels just like what we have in the logical organization but now channels are divided into multiple dims dual inline memory modules many of you would have already heard about this term each dim is specified by the cas act and pre latencies and also the data bus frequency along with its capacity dims are now divided into multiple dram devices and each dram device is made up of multiple dram arrays each dram device can itself be seen as a mini dram because the operation in one device is same across all the devices and we specify the dram device with its width as x4 or x8 so on the dram devices when grouped form what is called as a rank now how many of these dram devices form my rank it is it is determined by the channel width and the device width device width we already saw it can be 4 for an x4 device 8 for an x8 device so on the channel width is the width of the data bus if we say that the channel width is 64 and the device width is 8 it means that eight such dram devices make my rank ranks are further divided into banks banks as rows and columns we have already seen that now if you are wondering how a dim would look like many of you would have already seen it this is how a typical dim would look like each of these chips is the dram device now if you zoom into the description of this dim we have few information the first one is the capacity of this dim here it is 32 gb following that we have 4 r x4 it means that this dim is made up of four ranks and x4 says that the ranks are made up with x4 devices Following that, we have a number 2133, which is the dim frequency, specifically the data bus frequency, 2133 megahertz. So there are many variations of dims that are available. I have given a link. Not that I am endorsing Samsung here. I found that the link to be very useful, very informative. For the curious ones, they can go through it. 
there are many different aspect ratios of these dims this is the dim we have seen and it that is what is typically used in our desktop systems and workstations for laptops and tablets the dim size is smaller and if you are wondering how the dram would look like in on your mobile it looks something like this we have we can have a single or maybe two chips each of capacity of 2 gb or 4 gb together they are giving us the total capacity in our mobile phone so with that i'll pause this lecture